Namaste, everyone. We are here at the Kanha Shantivanam Ashram outside of Hyderabad speaking today to Daji on the occasion of International Yoga Day. So this is a wonderful, wonderful place. I got in here myself last evening and it's already been several hours of meditation. So Daji today is going to really give us an insight into, into what Raja Yoga is, how meditation links to yoga, and tell us a little bit about his experiences and how we can all imbibe these into our life. So Daji, just to begin, thank you so much for having me here. It's, it's, thank it's, it's you really a wonderful coming. place. Oh, and it's, it's a 2400 acre, 4000 acre campus, right? 1400. Oh wow, 1400 acres. Oh my gosh. And this was, and it's the headquarters. Um, of the of your organization, which is SRCM, Sri Ramchandra Mission. Sri Ramchandra Mission, and this was this this entire estate is still under under construction, and it's going to be the headquarters. And when did this project start? Well, it started long back, five six years back. Now acquiring land and developing, you know, this barren land into oasis. Kind of, that's why we call it Green Kanha. Yes, and yes. And it's still in the development right now. It's a construction site. Though we have so many programs going on parallelly. And I think it'll take a few more years, maybe even 10 years, maybe 20 years to finish it. I saw one very interesting thing. I saw a lot of trees that were almost in sort of plasters, you know, and hmm. I said, what's going on? And I was told that all of these trees were rescued from from other places Correct. and all brought here to be brought back into life. So will you tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do here with the environment? Because I've I don't think I've ever seen so many species of plants and flowers all in one place as I've seen here. So it's it's really something, it's like a museum of of plants. Well you know with growth India is on a growing trend. It's waking up. And when some growth is happening at a material level, you know, starting with infrastructure development, roads are widening. Roads are widening means trees are the one who gets the first plant. Remove them, we need to expand the roads. You, they will not remove, suppose some wholly constructed buildings are there, they will not remove. They will dare not move, but they will easily cut the trees. So. When we come to know and when some officers say, please take these trees and if it's within our budget, we'll go and pick them up. That's so wonderful. Yeah, so these trees which you found them here, they were actually rescued trees meant for felling. So we went there and prepared the field, prepared the field here before we brought them here, see. And they are here. And India is, I, I would say, such vast varieties of species. Uh, I think it has more than Amazonian forest. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It is not as dense because our people have lost the forgotten art of caring for the trees. Nevertheless, we have to bring back that attitude of worshipping helpless trees. That's true. And you know, Daji, I just saw a tree being cut the other day and um, I was shocked, really, that the inside of the tree looked like a human body. It looked like pieces of, it was red, it looked like it had veins and arteries. I said, wow, chopping a tree looks like you're chopping a human body, really, or an animal. You know, it, it, did, it did look to me. So I think there is some very special energy that even plants and trees have, which we don't really respect as much anymore as we once used to. It's a sad story. If you are very sensitive, very few people are these days though. Sensitive in the sense, feeling, perceiving others' sentiments, others' emotions, others' feelings, what they go through. <coughs> Trees, they come on a number one list. They absorb all that is unnecessary to human beings. Carbon dioxide for one, it is toxic for human beings but it will convert into oxygen, give it. I tell you, once I had a terrible, terrible, I would say, health problem. Where 
Alfred constantly dizzy. And someone said, why don't you sit beside the tree? Uh, motherly figure in my life. And request prayerfully that you sit beside this tree. Would you exchange our energies? My energy you can surely make use of. And I take your, I borrow your energy if you don't mind. And prayerfully sit beside the tree with your back. I said, okay, I can do that. And and surely within five minutes, I felt a big difference. There was this exchange and I, I felt relieved from the dizziness, which was just uh, kind of weakening me or had made me handicapped. And also as a person who is transmitting yogic transmission, you see, when I transmit to a tree and you happen to see the charge and later on, let us see if you transmit to a human being, if you wait for 10 days, the tree would retain the charge. Human being would have lost it in one day. On that note, I think that brings us to a, a good, a good um, point to talk about yogic transmission, which you've just heard Daji speaking about. So what the heartfulness way is, is it's all about meditation. It's all about transmitting yogic energy from one person to the other, and that's what preceptors do here. So I'd just like you to explain to everyone what this is. What does what what is yogic transmission number one? And number two, how does how is this yoga? Because today is International Yoga Day, so we're we're really talking about yoga. So how meditation fits into yoga and also you know a little bit about the process here that we practice at SRCM. Well heartfulness is not only meditation. Heartfulness is a way of life where you live by heart. Right? One of the elements of this practice is meditation. And there are so many other elements to this practice. But one of the main one is meditation. And how this meditation differs from many meditation, I would say, the only feature that distinguishes or separates this from the whole wide range of spectrum of meditations, that it has this uses of transmission, yogic transmission. This practice of meditating with yogic transmission was in vogue about 72 generations before Raja Dasharat. Oh, so that's before the time of the Ramayana Correct. that we're talking about. And that Rishi, during his lifetime, taught his uh, inositias how to meditate with yogic transmission. After his passing, that method was lost. And somehow in 1873, when my great grand master was born, he reinvented this when he was only eight years of age. And he, awo he was awakened to this technique and said, oh wow, this is it. And he started at very early age of transmitting to his fellow mates or elders in his, on his street. And with a single dose of transmission, he was able to transport their consciousness to the highest level. They would fall at his feet, but he's, he was so humble, he would not let them. Okay. So he said, I must do this. He must spread this message of how to transmit. So he prepared another gentleman during his lifetime and said, okay, hereafter you continue with this tradition. He was also coincidentally shared the same name, Ramchandra. One from Sahajanpur and one from Fadegad. Oh, so both were from the state of UP. UP, yeah. And a gentleman from Sahajanpur, we called him as Babuji. He, he had a brilliant idea. He said, why should I restrict this only to myself? I must train thousands of people who can also transmit. So he started preparing individuals in a yogic way. I mean, not everybody can transmit. One has to have some level of gunas we talked about earlier, sattvic gunas, or even if you don't have that elevated state of uh, consciousness, he would prepare them. He would move their consciousness from one level to another level. We can go into depths later on if you like to go into this, but good enough, heights are achieved so that a person becomes eligible to transmit this yogic uh, pranahuti. The original word is pranahuti. We call it as yogic transmission for lack of better translation. 
But pranahuti conveys a lot. Praha? Pranahuti. Pranahuti. Okay. Yeah, pranahuti. Just as, you know, people misunderstand this with sakti path and they misunderstand this with pranapratistha. Mm-hmm. You know, pranapratistha, you must be, you must have heard this. I have, I have. Yeah, where they have, a, you know, installing, before installing a, a statue or a murti. They do this puja in temples and and And, and they say the pandits will now infuse the prana. Yes. Or yes, the soul yes. in this uh, in statue, yes, in yes. murti, right? Now my argument would be: statue is not going to argue yes. or question that. Did you put this prana in me? Mm-hmm. If the person who is transmitting that prana into a murti, right? If that person is equally capable of transmitting to you, for example, you should be able to feel it. Yes, absolutely. I can say that. Oh. Now I have received prana. So basically, the yogic transmission that we're talking about is a transmission of prana. Exactly. And could you explain to um, to us what prana is? Because I think there's a lot of confusion. The word is used a lot, but then what really is prana? You know, prana is a life force. Okay. okay. To distinguish this, in, a, in no, I'll give you a small example. Two, three examples I give you to make you understand what this prana is all about. At the physical level, we need nourishment to sustain our body. We have a balanced diet, right? We take vitamins and minerals and proteins and all carbs in balance. Good. We exercise to maintain physical fitness. Next level, we have a second body, subtle body we call manas. Right? How are we enriching our manas, intellect, ahankar, and consciousness? How are we refining them? See? Very difficult to understand. Well, somebody might say, oh, I enrich my mind, I go to university, I go to college, I interact with people, I, I mean watch, books, you know, yes. read books, right? Watch YouTube videos <laughs> <laughs> in today's day and age. Like this. And, yes, like this. <laughs> so, that is one way of enriching your subtle body. We have a third body, causal body or current sarir, we call Atman. How will you enrich that? Our soul. How do you enrich that, see? So, pranahuti comes to play. And how do you feel that? How would you feel when that soul is enriched? We understand when physical body is enriched, you feel the difference. When the subtle body is enriched, you also see the difference between a person who is mentally enriched and mentally not so enriched. You can see the person, the way they behave, the way they talk, the way they interact. Like to as spiritually enriched person, how would he feel first of all, and how would others perceive such an individual? So once you receive prana, it makes a world of a difference. Now differences can is noticeable by others like this. Imagine for a moment the trees, you know, uh, which has starved in, during summer times, no water, but they thrive through. They, their life continues on with the root system. It absorbs water from the grounds. With the first rain, what happens? The life returns. The tree is so mesmerized, it's so delighted, so joyful. You can see the branches moving and it's so fresh. Life has returned. It's like that. Root system earlier gave life, but rain gave much more. Mm-hmm. You see, it, it changed its life altogether. It became full of life. Like individually also, we are sustained by our soul. When transmission comes, when this pranahuti enters our life, it's like that rain. And you know, Daji, even in the practice of the Hatha Yoga or physical asanas, we do try to generate prana in our body, through the asanas, through pranayama, in which we're doing breathing. But that generally, you know, it does take a little bit of time. You know, you have to keep on practicing and, uh, you know, you can't expect results and just say, 
in, in one single yoga class. So how long does this process of pranahuti take? Um, can it, does it take a lifetime? Does it take a few months, a few days, maybe a few minutes? What's your, um, you know, in this time-starved world, is it possible to, for people to get pranahuti or the yogic transmissions and use them in a timely way? So you can get it, definitely. I would recommend you do this experiment. I don't have to believe me. You don't need to have blind faith. We are done with blind faith. When somebody says, please believe in God, I'm glad today's youth is questioning, why should I believe in God? It makes parents and grandparents very angry. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, when someone says, do you believe in God? You know, most people, even grandmother, you ask, do you believe in God? Perhaps he might slap you. Why are you asking me such a question? Yes, I believe in God. But when you say, why do you believe in God? Then grandma will have no answer, except to say, you are foolish. Yes. <laughs> Education has spoiled your yes. mind. My mother taught me, my, our scriptures, our Sanskriti, our civilization, our culture, says God is there. It's okay, this tradition continues. But it can be beautified if this knowledge is translated into experience. Rather, experience should be able to firm up our knowledge and say, okay, now I realize the truth behind such statements like God is Sarvavyapi or Sarvavyapi, but do you feel his presence everywhere? You don't. Then your sentence is empty sentence. When you say God is Sarvajnani or he's, he knows everything, he's omniscient, but you doubt it every second. And you pray like hell. You didn't help me, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. You question him, you remind him, you're supposed to do this for me, you didn't do this. And you curse him. Mm. In the same way, omnipotency of God, we question. Knowledge is there, is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, you see. But spirituality, yogic practices ought to ideally bring about these things in a realistic way, makes us understand through experience. Absolutely. And I think what I found very interesting here at the campus is that there were no temples. So I asked, is there a temple? Are there idols? And they said, no, because that we, be, we believe that every person is God. So there's no need to worship in a temple at all. Uh, it's not looked down upon if you want to practice, continue your practice to do that. But I really like that concept that trees are considered God and people are considered God. And so that's that's something very modern, I would say, in its, yeah. it's, when it's a way of thought. <laughs> Is it modern? Absolutely. No, not really. I disagree with you with a lot of respect. Because even Vedas, you know, how did the worshipping of rivers started, worshipping of trees started, worshipping of rain started, worshipping of Mother Earth started, worshipping of the sky started. There is no mention in Vedas about worshipping a statue or worshipping a temple. There is no reference to temple in Vedas nowhere. We created later on as we start falling from our civilization. And we say, oh, God is there. It's like stencils given to a child. Bete, this is the way how you write A. This is the way how you write number one. So we, yesterday only we had an occasion where some big figures from the state came and then we had to light a lamp. And I had, I had forgotten lighting a lamp years behind. So I lit up a lamp. And then there were three photographs placed on the stage. And we are supposed to stand in front of the photographs and do the salutations and offer the flowers. Of course, a lot of, with a lot of respect, I did it. But then I spoke. Mm -hmm. I expressed my heart and said, look, Deepam is good. Lighting a lamp outside is great. But it is only symbolic to ignite that lamp within. Mm -hmm. See, we always pray to God, take me from darkness to light. Hmm? from ignorance to knowledge, from death to eternity. Yeah. Now, that lamp is a symbol. You don't have to go on lighting the lamp in broad daylight. 
say, to children it's okay, my dear child, light up that lamp in your heart. Let your heart be awakened. It's a symbolic gesture. Yeah. I'm not disrespectful of the photos they are placed. I, I honor them, I respect them. But to worship them, it's, yeah. it's a different it's story, a different see. Story. But you know, Daji, on that note, I want to talk a little bit about the heartfulness way. So this book has just come out and I've just begun reading it and I've, I've already found it really wonderful because it's, it's so simple and it talks about just the, the process of meditation that you go through here. One thing, a question that I often get from people is, oh, how do you meditate? You know, what is, and, and, and people are very confused these days because there's so many different kinds of meditations. And some people say, is it meditation just sitting down, closing your eyes and just clearing your mind of all thoughts? Isn't that meditation? But now it's become so complicated. You have apps for meditation. You have mantras for meditation. You have, um, gosh, all sorts of things for meditation, all sorts of devices for meditation. I know people who put things on their sort of head mm. to, 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 to sort of calm them down. They have meditative oils, meditative creams, meditative <laughs> perfumes. There's, there's a whole industry of, 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 of meditative items to, to help you meditate. So, so can you talk a little bit about this phenomena, about, about the confusion surrounding meditation and how the heartfulness way kind of tries to simplify it and also what you think about this booming industry of meditation. Of course, yoga is booming. We all know that. But along with it, I think the new wave now is meditation. So I think the yoga boom happened a little while ago. Now it's the new meditation boom. So your whole thoughts on, on the well, business you know, of meditation <laughs> and also how to just sort of get rid of all the confusion that we have around this idea of what meditation actually means. I'll put it very simply with a few questions that I'll be posing to you. When you're disturbed, when you're restless, can you be happy? Okay. So you have to be at peace to enjoy whatever in life. Right? Now, how to arrive at peace? How to be, <coughs> how to maintain harmony within? Is harmony possible without contemplative mind? Is contemplative mind possible without focused thinking? Is focused thinking possible without regulated mind? Is regulated mind possible without meditation? Is it? I mean... None of these are. None of this. So what about a so, scientist? So now, when you join these dots, we begin seeking for happiness. It's not possible in the field when you're restless. It has to be in the field where you're happy and at peace. Right? Peace is arrived at in a state of harmony. Harmony is possible when you are contemplative. Contemplation is possible when you're having a focused mind. Focused mind is possible when you have regulated mind. And regulated mind is possible only when you have meditation. So you can join the dots and say, meditation will take me to joy and happiness. So this is one simple thing, easy to understand. Meditation is even easier than this understanding. When you, let us say, most people, they find it difficult to meditate because they don't know, first of all, how to meditate. Second thing, when they start meditation, the thoughts that arise in meditation, it keeps them off. Yes. And they don't know how to channelize their mind and arrive at a focused level, which becomes contemplative, becomes harmonious, which becomes peaceful. How to, how to arrive at that? The key is in this pranavati, transmission. See, transmission, <clears throat> when we meditate with transmission, you can see the difference. You see, I'm a pharmacist and I know how to differentiate between a molecule mm. which is going to be effective for a particular disease yeah. versus a placebo. 
right? When a research is done, it is compared against placebo. If the effect is as good as placebo, the drug is not good. This is Daji also speaking with his background in pharmacy, you know, <laughs> so he is, before he, um, you know, not before, actually during his business life, he was continually practicing this and this also led to immense success in his work life, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later once Daji finishes telling us. So this bit about comparison this. of uh, active uh, med medicinal uh, molecule, uh, which is used for headache, or perhaps it is compared with another headache curing uh, medication, and if it is better than that, you have to forget the old molecule. New drug is in the market. Right? It is through comparison we arrive and make a scientific research. Right? Here. Spirituality also should be approached with a spiritual, I mean, scientific mind of mind. That's why I say, say goodbye to faith in the beginning. Though faith is equally required later on. But the basis of this faith has to be built upon your personal experience. This experience that you have had because of transmission and how this transmission can take you deeper within your consciousness, it, how it can make yourself lighter, how it removes the burden of misunderstanding and ignorance from you without even speaking a word. That's a magical thing, see? And this has to be experienced. I cannot talk about it. If somebody says, how do you feel in meditation? It's like saying, oh, how, how do you like my mango? It's, oh, it's lovely, it's sweet. <laughs> But then you can't say much more than that. So it can be anything, and, really. Uh, you have to try it out and see it. The most important thing is this, that because of this transmission, we are able to go deeper within ourselves, without which you cannot move at all in your consciousness. <clears throat> Why don't you just, so two, two, two questions to end, end our conversation with. One is, is, you know, you have led an extremely successful life. Besides, of course, now you're the head of this wonderful organization, which has centers in 170 countries and, gosh, probably millions of followers if we begin counting them. But you've also led a successful life in business and in work. And I think today's young generation wants to be able to balance those two things, you know. And a lot of people come to me saying, oh, yes, we can just become yogis, but to be like you, we have to practice three hours of yoga a day. We don't have that kind of time. We have to go to work. So how is it possible for us? So that's Well, you'll have to <laughs> meditate 24 hours. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm just joking. Okay, okay, good. Thank goodness for that. But, but so that's the thing. Is it, is it possible to combine these two, you know, to combine a, a, a sort of the, I would say, the heartfulness way of life as you initially began in our conversation? This is not just a meditation practice. It's really a way of life. How do you combine that with a life, um, you know, just a normal life where you also want to go out and party, you also want to go out and, and, and have a good time, you also want to be successful and work and make money and fulfill your desires of having a great house, having a, having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or having, you know, sort of luxury all around you. How do you, how do you bring those two lifestyles together? And is there a way of doing that? That's what precisely heartfulness is all about, bridging material life and spiritual life. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> you see, my first, the first question my trainer who initiated me into the system asked me, why do you want to meditate? I said, I want to become like Swami Vivekananda oh. and I want to travel all across India on my foot mm -hmm. and I want to touch all the holy places. Later on, I want to retire in the forest. I want to become sannyasi. So she corrected me. She said, do you think God is everywhere? I said, yes. Is he absent in your house? Very simple question. I said, she said, no need to answer, just think about it. Second question. Ishwar Beukufta, do sex banaya, male and female. So Grihastha life is very important. Okay. Here where the difficulties of Grihastha life, sacrifices that you make for each other, prepares you, prepares your heart for higher love, higher dimension of love. So that was very convincing to me. 
But coming back to your question, how to integrate bhautik or materialistic life and also balance it with spirituality. I don't think we should try to balance it. We should try to spiritualize everything that we do in the material world. Okay, that's good. Spiritualize everything that we do in the material world. Yeah. You go to a school, you go to college, you're with your girlfriend or boyfriend, you're in a restaurant. You are running a business, you're making a deal, you're signing a contract, you're on your honeymoon trip, you're in meditation hall, you're conversing with your fellow passenger, have heart in it. Remember that there is something within you which is pious, which is pure, and maintain it. So spiritualize all your interactions. and. Naji, on just a, a side note on that before I go to my final question, there's so many questions that we can keep on going, but I know we have a bit of a time limit. What about anger? You know, you talked about spiritualizing all your interactions, but it's normal in the course of life to lose your temper, to become a little impatient, to, to you know, anger, of course, now I think is the number one most um, widespread disease, really, mm. the way it's spreading. But how, 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 one, how can one... How could, does this practice, I would say, help with that? Can it? Because how it does is. meditation help with anger? What is the connection between both of them? Anger. According to my Guruji, he says, Kama and Krodha, they are God-given. They cannot be annihilated. Now, if you consider them as original energy given by God, and that science says energy cannot be destroyed, it can only be transformed. Or transmitted? Transmitted, if you transmit anger on someone, it will not be good. Mm-hmm. The purpose why God gave us this instrument, Krodha, is to cast it upon yourself rather than somebody else. Cast it upon yourself and see where you made a mistake, whenever you make a mistake and see to yourself when you say, oh, how did I do this? How could I do this? Why should I do this? And when you are angry at yourself, it becomes corrective in action. When it is, when you have to cast it on someone, pause. Allow this anger to settle down a bit before you express yourself. And once you become slightly meditative, it will change its face. Anger will become compassion. You will feel sorry that had you been angry on the other person, the results would have been different. But now you feel so sorry, you feel sad about that person, you feel pity at times. Yeah. You have to let go. See? Yeah. Same thing happens with passion. See? If you, what happens in passion? See? You take advantage of the other for your pleasure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's all passion. Without the second person, fulfillment of the passion is not possible. Mm-hmm. But when you wait enough, pause enough, become meditative and allow this passion to pass through your pure heart, it will change its face and become compassion. In compassion, you will care for others before you think of yourself. So passion also can change with pausing in a meditative way. So pausing just to lash out with greater force is different. The pausing to analyze and becoming more corrective is positive in nature. It will ennoble the other person also. You see, you can get angry. It's very easy to get angry and blast the other person. But what do you achieve out of that? See, you are destroying the relationship, number one. And when there is a scar, you may have, you may finish the discussion. You may agree. You may depart. Uh, with uh, affection, but no one can forget the the bout of anger that you have casted on other. That that hurt will always be there. The scar will always remain. Yeah. So we should avoid such things. You see. So and and with the practice, we can try to convert anger into a more meditative state and try to transform transform the anger that we feel. Daji, last question: Is it possible to transmit pranahuti? or yogic transitions over the internet? 
well what is internet <laughs> anyway See, it is way of informing the other person that let's talk about something okay. you see we over the internet when we do the face time means we are connecting each yes. other right skype we are connecting so the purpose of internet is to, is to connect with each other in the now i could be in brazil you could be in delhi and we remain connected oh please uh, let's meditate together now you could be in delhi i could be in brazil that's all and i could transmit even if you are on the moon or on jupiter you will receive this transmission so could we do that right now for the viewers why not a little brief transmission because as daji said it's all about experience and so let's do some yogic transmissions all together <laughs> as it is it is your international today. yoga day so yes. this is this is the way that we celebrate well if you're all ready <laughs> i'm also ready and quite excited about this proposal yes it's very really simple uh, you can do this at any time also but since you are are willing to experiment with it now please gently close your eyes and um, have an idea that divine light is already there in your heart that's all there is to it maintain this thought if other thoughts do come treat them as uninvited guests and focus on the idea that you are meditating and after 20 minutes you just get up on your own and see the difference and meanwhile during this 20 minutes i'll be transmitting to you so let's begin
That's all. Daji, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Now that people really understand the philosophy behind the practice, they will be able to get something really good out of it. So I think we've covered the intellectual part and now comes the experience That's part. Great. So thank you so much for thank enlightening you. all you. of us, me, especially and all the viewers um, with your wonderful message. And I do hope that all of you um, at least attempt this, even if it's 20 minutes, maybe this 20 minutes could change your entire life. So do take that leap of faith and try this wonderful practice for yourself. Thank you, Daji, Thank you. and happy Thank you. yoga day. Thank you. I wish everybody the same and may it be auspicious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.